Good morning. Um, uh, well, I hope everybody's fine after so many caipirinhas yesterday night. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to have here Kathleen. Uh, during his talk, I probably will handle some small pieces of papers. Um, I don't know why, but sh she'll tell, <laughs> tell you later. Uh, okay, welcome. Thanks very much. And um, thanks to all the organizers for inviting me. And thank you for, to all of you for being here this morning after such a great evening. Um, so I... Coming on the last day, I've had the privilege of hearing many of the presentations and, of course, the talks of the other three keynotes. And following on from many of you, I also want to offer something very speculative. Some of you may know that I'm part, currently part of CRISAP, which is a research centre in London, which stands for Creative Research into Sound Arts Practice. And this is what we do practice-based research and research through practice. So I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a theorist, but I am primarily an artist with a compositional background, and I'm interested in thinking through practice as well as about practice. So today I'm not going to talk about my work specifically, but to try and add something to the discourse here about the practice of listening. So as we all know, listening is a subject of an ever-growing number of books, research projects, PhDs and artworks, and indeed conference papers. Listening-based concepts and philosophies such as Schaefer's Reduced Listening, Murray Schaefer's Acoustic Ecology, and work such as Cage's Four Minutes 33 Seconds, scores emanating from Pauline Oliveros's deep listening concepts, and the boundary and liminal listenings explored by Flux as artists, as well as site-specific installations, such as Max Neuhaus's Listen series, with its exhortation to listen, 
are among the cornerstones of the theory and practice of sound art as it is currently, currently canonized in a Western context. So the development of sound art has encouraged and animated the practice of listening outside the concert hall, into the gallery and into ever more exotic fields. Artists are listening to everything. Birds, insects, other species, industry, the sea, glaciers, countries, rain, furniture, planets. But sound art has also arguably influenced how we listen. We're all familiar with these images from many CD covers and conference slides of a person, often male, often wearing headphones, often carrying a microphone, crouching, sitting or standing in a wood, a moor, up a mountain, on a glacier, in a cave, by a river, etc. They're usually alone, removed from society for better listening and accompanied by technology, also for better listening. And so what I find myself saying here today is quite the opposite to what G Georgina said two days ago. From where I stand within sound arts practice, this aestheticized retreat into the world of the ears does not in general include listening to people. In his notes for the listening series, Max Neuhaus says, quote, the impetus for the title was twofold. The simple, clear meaning of the word, word to pay attention orally and its clean visual shape, listen, when capitalized. It was also an imperative meaning, partly, I must admit, as a private joke between myself and my then current lover, a French Bulgarian girl who used to shout it before she began to throw things at me when she was angry. So, although this is a joke which might be familiar to many of us, does it maybe also highlight an important and often noticeable gap between listening modes, between private listenings and public listenings, sound art listenings and personal listening between how we listen to people and the attention we give to nature? So many experts have tried to teach us how to listen. Here is a little bit of self-styled audio guru Julian Treasure telling us a little bit about distinguishing noise and signal. We are losing our listening. We spend roughly 60% of our communication time listening, but we're not very good at it. We retain just 25% of what we hear. Now, not you, not this talk, but that is generally true. Let's define listening as making meaning from sound. It's a mental process, and it's a process of extraction. We use some pretty cool techniques to do this. One of them is pattern recognition. So in a cocktail party like this, if I say, David, Sarah, pay attention, some of you just sat up. We recognize patterns to distinguish noise from signal, and especially our name. Differencing is another technique we use. If I left this pink noise on for more than a couple of minutes, you would literally cease to hear it. We listen to differences, we discount sounds that remain the same. And then there is a whole range of filters. These filters take us from all sound down to what we pay attention to. Most people are entirely unconscious of these filters, but they actually create our reality in a way because they tell us what we're paying attention to right now. I'll give you one example of that. Intention is very important in sound, in listening. When I married my wife, I promised her that I would listen to her every day as if for the first time. Now, that's something I fall short of on a daily basis. <laughs> but it's a great intention to have in a relationship. As you can see, it starts promisingly enough. But instead of interrogating those filters and those classifications of noise and signal, Treasure tells a variation on the same tired old joke that Neuhaus cites, maybe the male sound artist's equivalent of the mother-in-law joke. They all start from the same assumption, that we are no good at listening, that we've lost the power at listening, that, if we, if, that we would be able to listen better if... And there's often a subtext that listening, this listening, is a universal panacea to all the world's wrongs. So certainly in sound arts, we adopt the technologies of listening, the microphone, the headphones, and we cut ourselves off from the world in order to listen better, to carry out our learned activity, 
our new sacrament as experts, taught by experts. But should we not be more critical of this arguably over-romanticized idea of listening? Who is this we that is listening? Is all listening equal? Is learning how not to listen as equally important for some people? Do we all have the right to listen or not listen? In what situations do and can we decide when to listen and when not to listen? How is listening affected by our individual subjective positions, for example, by our gender, our racial identity, our nationality or our class? In a recent post in Sounding Out the Sound Studies blog entitled Gender Sonic Violence from the Waiting Room to the Locker Room, Rebecca Lentiers talks about an article by professional pickup artist Dan Bacon entitled How to Talk to a Woman Who is Wearing Headphones. In the article, Bacon says, quote, she will most likely take off her headphones to talk to you when you say, hey, how's it going? But if she doesn't, just smile, point to her headphones and confidently ask, can you take off your headphones for a minute as you pretend to be taking the headphones off your head so she fully understands what you mean? Lynch's point is that points out that, quote, his article was criticized in articles that appeared in The Guardian, Washington Post and other news sites which pointed out that Bacon and his followers advocated ignoring a clear visual signifier of privacy in the pursuit of sex. Not only did Bacon feel entitled to a woman's time, they suggested, but also to an audience. What Bacon insists is two normal human beings having a conversation is in fact his unilateral right to be heard. So another question, who is forced to listen? Lentius goes on to say that if, as Jonathan Stern states in the Audible past, quote, listening is a directed, learned activity, end quote, then women and gender non-conforming people must learn the art of hearing, but actively not listening, of learning to direct one's attention elsewhere to ignore catcalls and shouts of abuse. So there seems to be a split between this all-inclusive, romanticized listening of sound arts practice and the real world practice of listening and attempted not listening experienced by many. A split between the exhortation or even the order to listen and listen better, to listen properly, and the day-to-day -day imperative not to listen. The Manifesto for Disordered Listening, which I'll be talking about later, is an attempt to explore this gap and to open up the one-dimensional approach to listening that seems to be suggested by much of sound arts theory into a more nuanced and deviant listening that incorporates a wider selection of listening experiences. Okay. Oh. Before going on to talk about the manifesto for disordered listening in, what, in more detail, I'll briefly explore works by three artists who are querying and queering our ideas of listening and how it is represented within sound arts practice. Each of these artists is concerned with focusing on and questioning some of the ways in which listening operates in society, and in some cases suggesting how it might operate differently, and thus disordering our commonly stated beliefs about listening in some ways. So in order to make her video work voicings, artist Laura Malakart worked with two groups of people who have never met each other. A group of refugees attending English language classes and a group of classically trained actors and voice coaches. The work uses accounts written by the refugees to the UK as scripts for the professional actors and voice coaches whose job it is to learn them so that they can deliver them in as convincing a manner as possible. And I hope that this will um, transcend the language barriers here. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, no, wrong one. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Okay, hang on a moment. <laughs> Oh. 
four years ago I moved to Southgate. Four years ago I moved to Southgate. Then my big problems started. My neighbours were very different people. First, my daughter, she couldn't speak English. First, my daughter didn't speak English. And when she went outside, the other kids said, you need to learn English first. You need to learn English first. You need to learn English first. Then you're going to play with us. When I came to this country, I never had any problems. I couldn't speak English. No one but said anything. When I came to England, I have got learning difficulties. When I came to England, I have got language difficulties. When I came to England, I have got language problems. When I came to England, I couldn't speak or writ English. It was very difficult for me. For example, when I came to England, I have got language problems. When I came to England, I couldn't speak or writ English. It was very difficult for me. My sister-in-law is not fair. I believe if my English was as good as it is now, I would stand up for myself and not let them treat me the way they did. Where is your husband? I went with my husband because I didn't speak English. I went with my husband because I didn't speak English. Lady was angry and said, where is your husband? When my husband came and lady said to my husband, your wife couldn't answer the question and filled the form. We don't have any alphabetical class for your wife. We don't have any alphabetical class for your wife. <clears throat> the work's power lies in between the syntactical and grammatical errors contained in the refugee's account and the actor's perfect English enunciation as well as the difficulties that they have getting around the tongues trained in another language as they ventriloquize the words created in an area of discomfort and tension, which somehow highlights how we as listeners generally receive, label those who speak our mother tongue less than perfectly, making us reflect on our own listenings. It is not so much through the words spoken, but the gap between the words themselves and how they are spoken that somehow opens up the pathos of the words themselves. UK Lebanese artist Lawrence Abu Hamdan's work, Conflicting Phonemes, also concerns the speech of asylum seekers. Language analysis for the determination of origin, or LADO, is an instrument used in several countries, including Australia, the Netherlands, and the UK, to determine the national or ethnic origin of asylum seekers. An interview with the asylum seeker is recorded and analyzed according to features such as accent, grammar, vocabulary, etc. These LADO analyses are usually made at the request of a government, immigration or asylum bureau, attempting to verify asylum claims 
but may also be performed as part of an appeals process for claims that have been denied. So Lawrence Abu Hamdan's 2012 work, Conflicting Phonemes, maps the speech of a number of Somali asylum seekers whose applications had all been rejected after the analysis of their language, dialect or accent by the Dutch immigration authorities. The tests seek to, to, sorry, the tests seek to determine that asylum seekers are actually coming from small pockets of relatively safe regions in the north of Somalia making it possible for their applications to be rejected. The work, realized in collaboration with graphic designer Janet Ulrich, is intended to demonstrate how the complex history of Somalia renders the simple listening act unreliable, where changes in accent no longer attest to someone's origins, but to their biography, journeys undertaken, and experiences on the way to their country of destination. It even changes, as this slide tries to map, it's insanely complicated, so we won't go there right now, but it even changes according to who they're talking to. So in this case, experts gathered together by Abu Hamdan explore and map the experiences of the Somalians and reconsider their cases. And in an almost impossible to read chart, map the correlation between historical events in Somalia and how this might have affected the element of accent. The work, which is part of Hamden's long-standing investigation into the voice and the law, turns a critical ear on this listening experience, exposing the oversimplistic and uncritical nature of the listening, a closed listening designed to exclude. Here it is in installation. So the third work I want to mention is Sophie Mallet's work, Liminal States, which shows how socio-political disordering of existing listening might be achieved by using radio to move across existing official national boundaries and structures. The work focuses on Melilla, Morocco, a permanently inhabited Spanish city on the North African coast, which Morocco regards as occupied territory. Melilla is a destination from people from the African continent trying to enter Europe through Spain. The Melilla border is marked by a six meter tall double fence with watchtowers, detection wires, tear gas dispensers, radar, and day night vision cameras. Liminal States, made in collaboration with architect Emma Letitia Jones, uses radio to reconfigure how listening might work across space and zones, both, both physically and metaphorically. Mallet says, I was interested in using radio as a tool for creating new architectures, architectures that are permeable, malleable, and movable, but that most importantly are, over, are able to overcome physical architecture. Within this work, I was most interested in, its, in the ability to circumnavigate both human and built architecture of border territories. The proposition was basically to imagine a structure of transmission and listening across the territory of Melilla, which in itself has become a liminal zone of border protection between Africa and Europe. So Liminal States was presented in 2016 as a multi-screen installation projecting original and found footage from Melilla and two separate radio transmissions broadcast sound works made up from radio transmissions from Melilla from both the Moroccan and the Spanish side, an original script and diegetic sounds from about news reportage sorry, diage diegetic sounds from news reportage about Melilla. And this is a very small clip of the installation. Moroccan women who are used as porters or portiadoras to carry back-breaking loads of goods across the border from the Spanish enclave into Morocco. Because the merchandise is taken as personal luggage, it enters Morocco duty-free. It's an ancient trading relationship, and it highlights the complexity of one of Europe's most southerly frontiers, a border defended by a six meter The one looking out constructs the view as she would like to experience it from the interior. But those on the other side don't have this luxury to frame and construct the view. This has been the role of architecture in enclosing space to construct a view of the world outside 
as you would like to experience it from within. From inside, the borders, the limits of this vast interior have become almost invisible. We can no longer see them. But the interior can only exist by exclusion. When the interior comes under pressure from those it excludes, its limits become instantly visible. Then they have an overwhelming physical presence. The limits are violent in their stasis. What they're trying to do is to, um, instead of confronting them with the military and the border guards, they are trying to build uh, even higher and stronger uh, defense infrastructure. So the idea is that basically this will make the border control less, uh, involving less human contacts, but much more done by uh, the infrastructures, which is, in a way, uh, easier to sell to, to Europe. Sound can travel where the body can. The radio spectrum, for example, is a landscape unto itself, carved into territories of military, state, and corporate control. Conventions govern what parts of the spectrum can be used by whom, a kind of oral border control. But radio doesn't obey its sovereign borders. Its reach depends on other factors, whether topography, the strength and location of transmitter and receiver. Radio's borders are shaky and moving. They can expand and contract, and they're difficult to map. At these nebulous borders, the clear signal becomes noise, and you hear incomplete and fractured signals. This noise is seen as interference, disruption. It's not necessarily comfortable to listen to. This is neither interior nor exterior. When signal becomes noise, it's a liminal state. So each of these works, Laura Malakart's voicings, Lawrence Abu Hamdan's conflicting phonemes, and Sophie Mallet's liminal states, help us to think about our own listening and that of the societies we inhabit. How we listen to people who are not like us, how we might distinguish noise and signal in a different way from maybe the very simplistic Julian Treasure definition, how listening is used for social control, and of course how listening may be used to overcome separations and can transcend barriers and walls. Each in some way seeks to challenge the current accepted norms of listening within sound arts discourse and practice, and to engage with the politics of disordering our listening habits. So the Manifesto for Disordered Listening also seeks to challenge the currently accepted norms of listening within sound arts discourse and practice and to engage with the politics of disordering our listening habits. It draws on the social sciences, cultural studies, feminist and post-colonial theory and oral history in order to try and highlight issues of subjectivity within listening practices and questions how we may listen and communicate with people across genders, cultures, ethnicities, species and age. The manifesto has been in development since December 2014, arising out of conversations with Hong Kai Wang, Keiko Anushi and Jeanette Jembere, then candidates for the PhD in practice at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, Austria. It was outlined over a two-day workshop with their student cohort, the course team and invited guests in June 2015, and has subsequently been developed and refined through discussion particularly with my Chris App and LCC colleagues and students, as well as through practice-based and scholarly research. So for the rest of this paper, I will briefly outline aspects of my work and some of the discussions that led to the development of the Manifesto for a Disordering Listening. And the Manifesto, which is a work in progress and as much a statement of a position as a series of statements for discussion, then concludes this paper. And the small pieces of paper which you have been given or will be given, something like that, um, maybe are ways that you might want to kind of feed in further statements into the manifesto as they might occur to you. So much of my own sound work is concerned with aspects of our listening relationship with each other and the worlds we inhabit. I want to concentrate on the bigger picture here rather than my own work. But to mention that in making works, which you can find on my website if you're interested, such as Preparations for Imaginary Conflict, Hidden Lives, Sandy Jaffers and the Ties That Bind, I have been particularly interested in using listening as a way of accessing that which is largely unseen, 
particularly with regard to people, place and language, and trying to interrogate through sound what that can tell us about social, cultural and political relationships. Over the last four years, as many of you know, as we, as we discussed yesterday, I've also been working both academically and in terms of creative practice on the connections between feminism, activism and sound. That work is focused around two main projects, Her Noise and Sound Gender Feminism Activism, and has a number of associated scholarly, practice-based and pedagogic outcomes. So the process that I want to now talk about for a little bit culminated in a first, which culminated in this first draft of the Manifesto for Disordering Listening, was initiated by an invitation from the PhD in practice in Vienna to work with PhD candidate and artist Hong Kai Wang to formulate Disordering Listening, a practical seminar, with the stated aim of collectively exploring feminist and activist approaches to the role of listening in relation to social and political subjects and subjectivities. Quote, in particular, we are interested in exploring acts and organizations of listening that are embedded in da daily life and that activate multiple responses, philosophical, psychological, phenomenological, perceptual, conceptual, political, etc. Four questions were proposed. What are our habits of hearing and listening? What is the knowledge of listening that we are accustomed to? What are the epistemic, ethical, political and cosmological modes of critical listening? And where do we locate these modes in our subjective discourse and experience? And what could it mean to propose a decolonial mode of listening? Our discussions were informed by the ways in which we individually approached and thought about listening in our work and the text that the student group had been studying as part of the PhD programme. Their recent readings had engaged with black and post-colonial studies in commoning, queer studies in utopia, feminism and border thinking, and decolonial studies. My collaborators expressed a desire to think about listening in relation to these texts, and particularly how listening can be approached as a form of action. It was an ambition as part of the seminar to collaborate with a local community group, and contact was made by my collaborators with Frauentroff Pyramidots, a migrant women's centre in Vienna, which was interested in some sort of initial experimental collaborative exchange. Much of my discussions with Hong Kai, Keiko and Janine were concerned with how to accomplish this. Our concerns ranged around issues of whether we could meet people and listen to them face to face, or listen to recordings made by these people for us, and of course, how to put either of these options into effect. The first option was impractical, and we were forced to go with the latter. So we tried to come up with a mechanism for collecting material that attempted to distribute agency away from us as sound artists who work with recorded sound and offer self-selecting and non-prescriptive invitation to people to record something for us which would in turn be reciprocated. We were also aware of the issues of language. We ourselves were communicating in English despite the fact that three of, of four of us were non-native speakers. The language of the PhD in Vienna was English, and we all had experience of working with speakers of languages in our sound work that were not understood by us and would not be understood by the wider primary audience for our work. However, we all felt it was very important that people chose a language they wanted to communicate to us in. At some point, the idea of open or tender listening crept into our communications, and we discussed whether we could possibly listen to each other in new ways, regardless of voice, accent, language, and conceived an idea of tender listening to people, or rather their recorded voices, and debated how this might disorder the expectations of both the listener and the speaker. After initial discussions about the practicalities and ethics of the proposal, it seemed that within the time scale of our workshop, the only possibility might be to openly invite people through Frau and Treff Pyramidots to record something for us in advance of the workshop that we would then attempt to listen to tenderly and openly. So on the basis of this, I proposed a workshop outline for the Academy, which started to try and open up our listening as a group with discussions of texts and a series of exchanges and exercises according to a variety of different principles taken from practices of oral history, radical politics, feminism and counselling, and then on the second day to listen to the recordings made for us, reflect on the listening experience, 
and formulate some kind of response to the people who had made the recordings for us. My primary objective, which was to have something to listen to that was entirely chosen and recorded by other people, which we could collectively respond to with a tender and opening performance of group listening, was influenced by a number of texts, many of which have already been cited here over the last few days. The first was the importance of listening as a privileged person fighting for justice from the feminist media website Everyday Feminism. In this, the writer considers how identity privilege can be a barrier to listening, quote, and because privilege conceals itself from those who have it, those of us who benefit from identity privilege are often unaware of the perspectives we deny, silence and stifle with our voice. He goes on to suggest practical measures that people can take to overcome the refusal to listen, which he considers one of the, quote, most powerful weapons as a person of privilege. Listening, first of all, must be more than looking for tidbits from another person that confirm our worldview. Listening must be more than waiting to respond or hoping for dialogue. Listening must be more than choosing one tokenized voice that represents in our mind all people of color or all women. Listening is the process of opening oneself up, not only to another's words, but to the sum of their lived experience behind those words. Listening is bearing witness to the testimonies, stories, emotions, and experiences being shared. Listening is opening ourselves with a desire to learn and understand before we look for engagement, disagreement, or dialogue." End quote. I was also mindful of black American feminist bell hooks writing on marginality and post-colonialism and the importance for speaking for oneself rather than being spoken for. Quote, no need to hear your voice when I can talk about you better than you can speak about yourself. No need to hear your voice. Only tell me about your pain. I want to know your story and then I will tell it back to you in a new way. Tell it back to you in such a way that it's become mine, my own. Rewriting you, I write myself anew. I'm still author authority. I'm still colonizer, the speaking subject, and you are now the center of my talk." End quote. Finally, issues around imposing a language of communication loomed large. Long ago, linguistic anthropologist Sapir identified that unique realities are shared by language groups. Quote, language is a guide to social reality. The real world is to a large extent unconsciously built upon the language habits of the group. No two, languages are e no, sorry. no two languages are ever sufficiently similar to be considered as representing the same social reality. The worlds in different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same world with different labels attached. So many others have developed these ideas to illustrate the impossibility of communicating through the language of the oppressor. So bearing these things in mind, Honkai, Keiko and Janine negotiated a tender listening exchange with Frauentreff Pyramidops, which resulted in a number of recordings being gathered. The invitation issued was to participate in an open tender listening workshop and asked of the people who were recording, what can open or tender listening mean? Can we get beyond representation by listening? How can we explore this opening listening that would open ourselves? We want to think this together with the proposition, quote, listening is opening ourselves with a desire to learn and understand before we look for engagement, disagreement or dialogue. Women individually or in groups were asked to speak as they wished in their choice of language without the presence of interviewers. And the promise, that, the simple promise was that recordings would be made at the workshop and sent back in the same spirit. So the Vienna workshop took place over two days in June 2015. About 25 people drawn from a number of primarily European nationalities, Honkai and Keiko accepted, attended the workshop. The first day was designed to activate people's listening, to sharpen it up, to consider what we liked and did not like listening to, and to try and break down barriers to listening within the group. It's alternated between the group performing listening exercises, text scores from composers such as Pauline Oliveros and Anaya Lockwood, both individually and in small groups, and discussions of aspects of listening. The group was vocal, used to academic questioning and criticism, and very quick to vocalize, less quick to listen. On the second day of the workshop, we planned to listen to the recordings made for us and to discuss our experience open and tender listening and respond in some way. 
Before we listened to the recordings, there was a long, heated and detailed debate about the exercise, in many ways reflecting the discussions that we'd had prior to the workshop and which focused on issues of identity and linguistic understanding. While some of the people in the group felt it was, dis felt it was disrespectful to listen to a disembodied recorded voice without being able to see the person speaking or an image of them, Others could not understand the point of listening if the speaker was using a language they could not understand. After a lengthy debate, we listened to the contributions in order to honour the agreement made for open and tender listening. After listening, there was more debate about our experience of listening. Many people in the room were uncomfortable for various reasons. Um, and felt that the listening experience had been a waste of time. Others felt that they had gained new insights and been emotionally affected by concentrating on the quality of the voices and various philosophical insights resulted from this. Everyone in the room had been severely challenged in some aspect of how they thought about listening. Many of the workshop participants recorded a response for the participants and others from Frown Trip Pyramid, Pyramid Docs. It's impossible to summarize what happened in the workshop more neatly than this, but these experiences gave rise to the first incarnation of the Manifesto for Disordering Listening. And I would be grateful for your additions and comments to the Manifesto on the pieces of paper you have in front of you, if you think of it now or maybe by email later. Some parts of the Manifesto are obvious, some are maybe not so obvious, but in general, it tries to start a more multidimensional approach to listening than the one that had been identified earlier on in this paper. So, disordered listening aims to be open. We are always at the center of our own listening, just as we are the, at the center of our world. But what we choose to listen and choose not to listen to is to some extent controlled by us. However, the placement of our listening bodies in relation to what we hear and what we have to listen to is not always in our control and is often imposed on us from outside authoritarian sources. Listening can provide a temporary retreat, but is not an excuse for an escape into solitude. Listening has to be an active engagement. We cannot always expect to understand what we listen to, or if we only listen to things that we understand, we are limiting our listening and our potential to new and different understandings. Although we can listen all around us, we can also selectively choose what we tune into and conversely tune out of. When we are listening to one thing or a person, we're probably not listening to another. Sound can come from everywhere, both inside and outside. We can never shut down our ears physiologically, but it is very easy not to listen. Not listening can be a positive experience. Listening and not listening are not the only possibilities. There is selectively listening, partially listening, occasionally listening, etc. Not listening can be an active choice. Quote, injunctions to listen perpetuate structures that allow privilege and power to be naturalized. It is evidenced in the ever-expanding cure for what ails us socially, in politicians' listening tours, the teaching of listening skills as part of managerialism, and the redrawing of political communication as dialogue without redistribution. Our world is constructed according to stories we listen to. The histi historiographic question of why weren't we told might be better recast as an ethical one of why weren't we able to listen, or even who was granted the listening apparatus. Where was this listening happening, and with what temporalities, and to what extent could this listening ever become collectivized? We are always contributing to what we are hearing, but when we are sounding, it is often difficult to be also listening. When you are thinking about how you're going to respond to what someone is saying, it is difficult to be listening to them as well. Listening is not the same as imagining or anticipating what someone is going to say or is saying. People like feeling listened to. If allowed, their sounds can enter and inhabit our own bodies. Listening enshrines power relationships. Listening is not democratic. The listener is historically situated, reflective, contestable, uncomfortable, partisan, and fraught. Listening can transcend boundaries 
and other architectural, institutional and national barriers. Technology can help listening and also not listening. Making people listen or enforcing listening on them is an exercise of power. Not listening can also be an exercise of power. Listening can be boring and time consuming. Listening and not responding or sounding can be difficult. Understanding what you're listening to can be very challenging, but listening is also a necessary prerequisite to any kind of understanding. Listening is also a prerequisite for most meaningful communication. Listening alone is not enough. We need to be conscious of how our different subjectivities, race, gender, class, nationhood affect our listening, our understanding and interpretation. Oh, sorry, our understanding and interpretation of what we hear is totally predicated on who we are. Listening demands, oh sorry, gone. <laughs> listening demands ethics. Who can listen to who and when? Permissions can be no negotiated, but not with all subjects. Non-negotiated permissions can be termed eavesdropping, surveillance, or spying. Oh, missed my last slide. So listening is policed, controlled, and maintained by silent agreement in different places and spaces. Jennifer Stover Ackerman has investigated, quote, and was as, as was quoted yesterday, listening as an interpretive site where racial differences coded, produced, and policed, excavating invocations of peace and quiet and descriptions of noise to reveal the racialized edges of both terms. She goes on to develop her notion of the sonic color line as a dominant sonic protocol that attempts to contain the sound of others and silence alternative listening practices as aberrant and dangerous, even in human. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cathy, for presentation. Um, it's time for questions. So, if anyone has questions for Cathy, um, yes, um, I, I have a, a quick question actually, um, which is that uh, you're talking in the beginning about um, decolonizing listening, which is a word that's come up quite a lot uh, during the conference and um, I just thought it was interesting to um, mention the museum, the MASP, which actually in its, um, they have a kind of handout and they talk they about have a kind of what, sorry? A handout. They have oh, right. a handout uh, that they, that you can pick up when you go in there and actually that's all about decolonization. <clears throat> sorry. And of course these are visual works but I thought it was, I thought the approach was quite interesting. I mean for instance they they put the work, instead of putting the work on the walls, on the, on the, I mean, the main collection, like the Picassos and so on, they put them on these easels so that you can actually, and the idea is that you can go up to them, you can look at them, almost touch them. <laughs> and then um, the other thing they do is that, um, sorry, I got sick. And then, so the other thing they do is that they have, instead of having just paintings, this is on the other floors. Instead of having just paintings, they have, um, you know, objects which can be anything. Like uh, they, there was um, a, reconstru a re reconstruction of an exhibition there, um, of an exhibition that had already been held. And in that exhibition, it was their first exhibition, so quite important for setting the tone. There were a lot of, you know, art and craft objects. There were pieces of furniture. There were lots of very different things. And I was wondering if if perhaps one could, you know, if it might be useful to transpose some of these ideas, because for instance, having, um, you know, archives is already something that sets borders, um, you know, as, I, as I think has been said already, but al also the fact of having lots of, you know, perhaps not having such a focused archive, but having other, you know, other kinds of works as well. I mean, I'm just wondering if there are any kind of, um, you know, conclusions that can be drawn from that, like not having things, you know, kind of archives that are as structured as they seem to be for the moment in, in sound. Okay, anyway, it's just an idea. Thanks. 
Um, I haven't really got a response to that. Is that you haven't got a question, have you? Or have you? Yes, sorry. Sorry, will you say your question again? Any, any con thanks. Whether any conclusions can be drawn from that and whether mm. we can actually look at archives in a different way, perhaps inspired by these two um, mm. um, you know, courses of action that they're using in the museum. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm really not sure. I feel like to, that I have to sort of very much switch from the mode. I mean, obviously, um, archives and the approach to archives and how they are organized and according to whose subjectivity is really, really important. Um, but in a way, I suppose what I've been trying to put forward is something that's much more personal and individually individual. And I don't know whether, you know, I feel the handout is a bit like the, um, it's like Neuhaus's kind of, you know, instruction to do that. I don't want to be instructed by someone else about how to do these things. Well, I mean, I do want to be instructed by loads and loads of people, but I want to, I don't want to be instructed by yet another sort of authorial figure on, on how to do these things. And I don't want any more sort of authorial figures organizing these things for me in a way. I want a kind of plurality of voices and approaches if that makes sense in, in answer to your question. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I didn't think the handout was really trying to, you know, to be authorial, actually. I think it was just trying to suggest, actually, what, what you were just saying, that, that, um, you know, that an archive should be less um, constricting, perhaps, you know, in some ways, and also that it should be much more plural as well. I mean, I think that's what they were getting at. So. Mm -hmm. But were they doing it? Um, yes, I think they were actually. Yes, I think the exhibition definitely did that. I mean, they had a lot of very different kinds of objects, completely different that you just wouldn't expect mm. to see there. And so it actually changes your perception, I think, mm. of one's perception of what one's seeing of the artwork. I mean, I think there's a kind of difference between your appreciation and the object and what we're talking about here, which is kind of relational, you know, which is the, pra the daily practice of listening. I mean, there are maybe, um, maybe there are um, relations with the daily practice of seeing, but, but they are different. They are different because you are constantly in a, um, a sort of subject position that is affecting the things around you in a way that seeing isn't maybe doing that quite so directly. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for this wonderful um, talk. I really like the the kind of ambiguity between sort of the idea of deviant listening and tender listening and kind of navigating that. But um, my question is about language. And I was really curious um, about the workshop that you described in the, in the way that people were um, sort of asked to be listening to things that were not in a language that they understood. And so I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about the experience of that and how that went for people and what did people hear or listen to when, when that happened and what was that experience like? It was really awkward and really difficult. And, and I mean, this is an experience, I mean, partly an experience that many people in this room are having now too, but you know, which I'm very aware of. Um, it was very, very strange because in the room there were probably people who spoke maybe, I mean, you know, English was a sort of uni a uniting language as usual, but probably there were at least kind of 10 languages in the room. And then the language that we were speaking, that we were listening to were probably another eight or nine, of which maybe two of them, one person in the room, um, understood them and so in the end I, I i kind of think that the conversation well the conversation ranged around um the debate that i mentioned which is you know the, the two polar points were what is the point of listening to people who we can't understand 
you know, which in that context um, seemed kind of very relatively normal. But if you take that out of that context and just ask that question, then it's really sort of outrageous, actually, <laughs> and kind of reflects, you know, very many, many things, lots of issues. And then the other side of the coin was what can we learn from people? What can we learn from when we don't understand that language? And obviously, then everything becomes totally subjective <laughs> because you've got no way of actually checking it. You know, so if whatever you think that person might be talking about, whatever you can hear, you're surmising all the time, which maybe also says something really significant about listening. <laughs> so in a way, um, yeah, that the some people were better able to kind of well, some people were better able to listen, and some people were better able to kind of um, sort of what can I say? Uh, take content, if you like, or understand content from the voice apart from the actual semantic meaning. Um, and these things were sort of offered and discussed. But really, the main thing in the room, the main debate centered around being able to understand the words, you know, um, rather than any other kind of anything that lies between the words or... And, and yeah, the overall feeling was that by listening to someone who we didn't understand, they were diminished. Um, hello, Cathy. Hello. Um, I'm actually just wanting to pick up on something that Ram has already spoken about. And perhaps it's not a question directed to you and more to the workshop as a whole, that um, we've seen this word decolonial come up from time to time. And my question is, what is that word doing? And what are we seeking to do with that word as we mobilize it? And I'm thinking of Fanon, when Fanon says that decolonialism is a violent phenomenon, which is a serious indictment and a serious thing we need, to be, we need to take if we are using the word that, are we prepared to undergo the violence it implies? And in thinking about what you are saying, and just thinking aloud about Fanon's ideas of mental disorders as well, and the implications thereof, being being illegible, being 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 not being able to be empirically verifiable, verifiable within a system of 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 listening paradigms that 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 are related to biometrics and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, my suspicion is that, uh, and I know I want to be really critical. My suspicion is that we don't really we don't really believe in colonialism. I think we're just saying it just to, you know the flavor of the moment because my question is how would those inst same institutions allow people to speak of decolonialism when they don't represent it unless if it's doing something else in the service of those institutions we occupy those university spaces we occupy is it not maybe paving the way to attract rich chinese and rich indian students to come study in the uk and bring more money to the west to the global north my suspicion is that these are things that are, are, are happening within the very apparatus of the academy and the very um, apparatus of our speech, that our speech is being hijacked as we already, uh, while we are saying it, and that it, it happens in the service of something that doesn't really believe it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually totally agree with you. <laughs> I, I, I think that is true. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert on any of these things. I'm just trying to think through listening as a sort of a kind of personal and an interpersonal within the way it's been formulated within sound arts context. But I do think that, um, yeah, it's obviously a kind of buzzword at the moment, totally. And I don't think, I mean, when, when it comes to the institutions, I think what we see time and time again is that the institutions are going, are prepared to go so far with anything that they regard as kind of non-normative. And the minute that upsets the apple cart in any way, then 
it shuts down. And yet they probably are using it as a cynical way of getting Chinese students, certainly in the UK. <laughs> you know, and I'm not defending it <laughs> in any way. <laughs> Does anybody else have a comment on that, though? It would be really interesting to hear. I think uh, in that sense, what Tokozani was saying, we really need uh, the institutions to think about themselves in another way or just to start them in another way. And I think in our area, maybe we could um, um, I think the real decolonization would happen if we just see each other as being in the same plane, in the same rhizome, rhizome of, uh, and we could, uh, through sound, maybe also engage more and more people and have a real communication uh, about that. But it's it's real, really a, a good question. What will we do with this word? Uh, will it get so common that it's empty of its meaning? Mm. Um, so it's really a question what to do with this. No? Um, <clears throat> and being now in a very new university that is being built from the ground for, for two years no? and seeing how an um, institution with a different approach from the beginning, from the start on, really can do something in that direction. It's not compromised with what tradition or how traditional universities have been built. No? Um, so I think maybe one of, of the answers will be that, you know, to think of other institutions in one sense, but maybe more than that, uh, in other types of organization that really deconstruct and don't empty the, the meaning of that word as a sign for a movement, as a, a movement where we recognize there, was a, there is an injustice everywhere in our planet, in our world, that needs to be rethought, and more than rethought also, in, in action, being put in action in another way. Um, so one of the colleagues said, it's just an honor to have someone from South Africa here, for instance, or India. No? And then we ask ourselves as Brazilians, do we go to conferences in South, South Africa? Do we apply or do we try to help an org uh, the organization of someone who is doing something there, for instance, too? And I think this kind of uh, attention to, to what is happening in the rest of the world, it's part of it. Mm. So just observations. Yes, thank you. I agree. Mm. I think one thing that we should also take into account is which we are talking about decolonization and we're referring specifically to the European colonization of the rest of the world. But right now, as we speak, uh, there are other types of colonization taking place. You know, we are being also recolonized by the Starbucks, by the Amazons of the world, you know. And um, I think it's a good thing that we worry about the colonization that took place over the last 400 years. But we pay attention to this sort of colonization that's happening right now as we speak, you know, as as you have all these... Uh, smart uh, things like, you know, Uber or our Airbnb or Spotify colonizing aspects of our daily life and we're not really aware of that, you know, so there is also something to pay attention to. Yes, of course. I mean, I agree with that, you know, but um, this I, I'm not a politician, you know, and I, <laughs> I'm a sound artist. And what I'm interested in is how that colonization or whatever we call it, how those new normal normalnesses or how those new norms are being established within sound arts practice in the way they were established in sort of music, in the way they've been established in electroacoustic music composition, you know, how they are just kind of without necessarily being questioned, how they're just sort of establishing themselves and then kind of parading themselves as a kind of norm. So that, that's the thing that I'm most interested in here. And I suppose in this, I've tried to kind of, um, through, you know, the, the, the workshop in Vienna, it wasn't, you know, I was, it, was a, it wasn't my idea. I was invited to do it with that kind of brief. 
And, you know, after freaking out for a bit and thinking, no way am I going to do that, I sort of felt like I had to rise to the occasion. <laughs> and, and what happened was a really interesting and difficult exchange, which has made me think about things, in, a, in a, made me try and think about things in a different way. How that actually um, um, translates into practice, uh, as in, my sound arts practice, I mean, I can sort of see how it can translate into my daily life practice, but it, how it translates into my sound arts practice is something quite difficult and sort of ongoing. But um, I suppose I kind of, um, I sort of believe in the old second wave feminist adage that the personal is political. <laughs> and I think that's the only place to start personally, you know, and that that is, and when you're making work or when you're teaching, you have to think about what you're teaching and why you're teaching it and where it came from and what you could be teaching or making work about instead. You know, that's my, <laughs> and you could make work about Uber. <laughs> And so, um, knowing what you know now, uh, if you're gonna, if you were happening to do the same workshop again, what would you do differently? Oh my God, that's a great question. <laughs> mm, I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> no, I would do it. Um, do you know what? I don't know whether okay. I'd do anything differently, to tell you the truth. I think what I might do is be read bit. No, I, I don't think I'd do anything differently. Yeah, I think I would try and do the same thing. And I'd be very, very interested to do that workshop with a different group of people. Because I think that, you know, these highly vocal PhD candidates, and they were highly vocal, it's a very kind of uh, critical and theoretically heavy PhD program, in fact. Um, that their willingness to speak over their willingness to listen was quite extraordinary. And that you probably find that in a lot of academic settings. You know, people are just ready to come in with their, their thing and their opinion that they want to say. And I think that, you know, it would be really interesting to do that kind of workshop in a different setting, actually. That would be what I, yeah. I'd change the participants. <laughs> Hi, thank, thanks for this. Yeah, it looks like it's on. Um, this may not be a great question for you, but <laughs> I'm sorry. It's something that's occurred to me in several talks over the last few days because we've been hearing a lot about uh, non-human sounds, and I've been wondering about non-human listening. Mm. So I, I'll just throw that out to you just like that and see if you have a response, or if not, maybe somebody else does. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, probably other people do have. Um, I feel that uh, this is something that isn't my specific area of expertise or interest, but there are many artists working in a really, really interesting way with that. Um, and yeah. I'm very interested in their work. Probably other people here know more about it. I mean, the work I'd like to just point you to is the work of Mark Peter Wright, who is questioning, um, questioning really what happens when you go into a space and make a field recording of some non-human entity, um, how that space might be disturbed, how that space can be rethought, how the experience of the person, the person, this, the entity recorded might have changed. Um, and I think there are probably others which other people here might, might well know about. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, <clears throat> whenever I start a graduate seminar, I walk in and before I introduce anything, I asked the question, uh, what makes a good discussion? Uh, and then I just stop and 
and let the discussion begin. Uh, and there's always moments of awkwardness and tension between uh, the things that people are talking about regarding making a good discussion and the, the importance of listening in that uh, and the way that they're taking the stage. So when we're talking about listening, there's always that tension. Uh, and, and it often has uh, a, a moment where it comes to a head uh, and, and there's the laughter of recognition that there's a gap between uh, what's being talked about and how it's being talked about. Uh, and then things realign in a really interesting way. Uh, and I was wondering if in the creation of the manifesto, uh, if there was that kind of awareness and, and kind of what was the dynamic in terms of uh, a moment of, oh, wait a second, maybe I should take a step back and, and, and kind of internalizing through people's actions um, what was being talked about. Um. It wasn't that neat somehow. <laughs> um, no, it would have been quite nice to have had that. Actually, what happened was, in a way, that uh, yeah, the 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 day of the the tender and open listening was a day where there was a lot of kind of. I mean, a lot of people had a lot of things to say even sure what they all were you know it felt like a lot of the time everybody was talking at once I, mean, I did, did think there was you know the listening was not of the best quality in general <laughs> um, and that actually the day after you know i had a very long debrief long and leisurely debrief with the uh my other three collaborators and we tried to pull something together from that um, and that has then been sort of refined in, in further discussion with other people. So it, it was never neat. It was never, hey, we've talked about this, and now we can make these 20 points. You know, right. it was, <laughs> it's been much more sort of speculative and like, well, this is probably the case, but then this is also the case, and yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we don't have more time for any more questions. So thank you so much, Kathy, thank for your you. presentation. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.